Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Asha, and I'm part of the IHS Word Lab and the library team, and together we host public text every month. Uh, before we begin, just a few pointers to keep in mind. I'm sure you guys already know all of this, but just to keep everything going smooth. If you have any questions, please drop them off at the Q&A box at the bottom of your screens. We'll be picking them up uh, during our question and answer session. We'll also be recording this session and it'll be made available on, our, uh, on the IHS YouTube channel. So in case you want the link, you can find that also in the chat box. Uh, and if you'd like to stay updated with all the events that we do, please drop in a line. We can, you can actually just put in uh, your email ID in the chat box as well, and we'll keep you updated with whatever is happening. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our guest today. We have Taran Khan and Shoma Ghoshal with us, and they'll be talking about Taran's debut book, uh, Shadow City, A Woman Walks Kabul. Uh, Taran is a journalist and writer based in Bombay. She grew up in Aligarh and was educated in Delhi and in London. Uh, she's been widely published both in India and internationally. And from 20, uh, 2006 to 2013, she spent long periods living and working in Kabul. And Shadow City is the product of this wonderful time that she spent there. And her book has also been shortlisted for the first book award in nonfiction for the 2020 Tata Literature Live Awards. Uh, Shoma, who will be moderating this session, is a writer, editor, and journalist who's interested in the arts, culture, and human rights. Thank you so much for joining us today, and uh, over to you, Shoma. Thank you, Asha. Um, it's a real pleasure to talk about a book which one has really enjoyed thoroughly, and I congratulate Taran for the nomination for the award as well. Thank you. Um, I just want to start by saying that um, this book, uh, I started reading with the conventional expectations of a travelogue, but I came away from it feeling much richer. Uh, it has got so much poetry, so much humanity, so much heart into it, that it just doesn't feel like any other travelogue or journalistic account, which we are so accustomed to reading. So it has really sort of given me uh, so much in the last few days and especially making a city which one has heard about in so many ways, you know, it's been kind of romanticized in our imagination, thanks to the war and the history of Kabul in so many ways. And in my case, as a Bengali, grown up uh, reading uh, Tagore's story about the Kabuliwala, which Taran also writes about, and uh, Mustafa, Mustafa Ali's book on Afghanistan, which is a very hilarious, wonderful story of his travels through Afghanistan. So, Coming from those points, I felt the book spoke to me in a very, very different way. Um, so before we begin conversation, this conversation about the book, I think we could just start with Taran reading a couple of pages, maybe from the start of the book, and then Thank we can go on to the questions. Thanks very much, Shomak. I'm so glad the book appealed to you and that you caught the references. I think Mishra book is one of the wonderful, it's like a wonderful memoir, it's one of the books. I wish I had come across earlier. I'm grateful there's an English translation. Now I envy the people who grew up with that reference to Kabul. Um, thank you, everyone who's listening. Um, I'm going to start by reading a bit from the foreword of the book. Um, this is uh, Shadow City, A Woman Walks Kabul. One of the first things I was told when I arrived in Kabul was never to walk. It was early 2006, five years after the overthrow of the Taliban government by the US-led coalition forces around the same amount of time that the Taliban had been in power before 2001. Winter was just beginning to fade, and like the seasons, Kabul was on the verge of turning, so we did not know it then. As spring transformed the surroundings, I joined the rush of bodies on the street and took my first walk in the city. My memory begins from a place I almost certainly did not start from. I must have got there somehow, but in my mind, I first recall moving through a bazaar called Monday on the southern side of the Kabul River. I remember making my way through narrow lanes and shops that extended onto the street. Traders and their carts spilling onto the thoroughfares, stepping around the piles of dried fruit, tins of cooking oil, soap. The way the dull sunlight of that rainy spring day filtered through the canopies erected over some shops. The earth was muddy, the market not too crowded. Familiar, like the bazaars of cities I knew in India. I recall walking onto a bridge and buying a check scarf from a young man standing by its railing. His face was barely visible behind his stock of fluttering fabrics, which he had tied to a wooden frame resting on his shoulders. He smiled when I took his picture. Behind him were the mountains that encircled Kabul, the Koya Sher Darwaza on my left, the Koya Asmai to my right. 
Between them, below the bridge, was the river, sluggish with some water, some rubbish. I moved across the bridge, and in the process, I spanned the city's history from the Shahre Kona, or the old city, to the Shahre Nau, or the new suburbs ahead of me. Memory returns in fragments. I remember walking through the half empty streets, feeling the sun on my back. I heard snatches of song on the radio, past a group of young men lounging on a broken sofa they had pulled onto the street. I saw walls with bullet marks, barriers across gates, and the glass panes of shop fronts painted with calligraphy. Under my feet was a slush of the spring. There was smoke rising from the chimneys and evening coloring the snow on the peaks of the Pahman Range on the horizon. Birds on the bare branches of trees singing songs of the approaching dust. Back in my room, I had tried to brush the mud off my shoes, my clothes, but it had clung stubbornly. I had looked out of the window. Beyond the walls that enclosed the courtyard, the city had changed. It shimmered like a prom promise, far larger than I had thought. The more I walked, the larger it revealed itself to be. And with that beautiful poetic passage, uh, Kabul really comes alive. And also for you, especially as, as a writer visitor to Kabul, I think there's a much longer association which you also write about through your family and especially through your grandfather, who sounds like just the loveliest man I've read about. Yeah, he was, yeah. And my friend once told me that he's the kind of grandfather you hear about in stories and I realized that was true. You know, he was, he's the uh, grandfather we all wanted to have. <laughs> yeah. I guess I was very fortunate about my grandparents were wonderful people to grow up around. And um, uh, like you said, I mean, I didn't really have an association with Kabul beyond what I suppose we all have in terms of some kind of literary association, like you with the Kabuliwala. Similarly, for me, I suppose most Indian children would have that. And my father's side of the family is of Pashtun heritage. So there was this sort of affinity this, to, to this country or to this land, which we felt was fascinating. But this was very much an imaginary. I won't give away too much of the book, but as you know, it was purely imaginary and not entirely based in fact as well. So my grandfather, my nana, my maternal grandfather was actually, he gave me a frame when I got to Kabul. I would, you know, wander around, meet people, learn things, and then I would come back and tell him things. And he had never been to Kabul. But he said that, you know, there are some cities that I've never visited, but I know really well. And Kabul was one of them. And this was through reading, through poetry, through the shared cultural connections that he was so fluent in. So I would go there and spend time there and then I'd come back and tell him things that I learned. And he said, well, yes. And then, you know, there's also this other thing. And then I'd go there and find that there would be other things that emerge and I'd come back and share it with them, him. So it was this sort of a bridge that built, he built from his study in Aligarh, which is where he lived and where I grew up, to Kabul. And I would be walking, or in a sense, with him by my side and with him to guide me in the city that he had never actually seen. But he was so much more fluent in, you know, he just... I felt that he would be very comfortable there. And I felt that people there would sort of recognize him. And of course, a part of it was also gestures, just the way he carried himself. I saw a gentleman walking down the road and uh, he returned the salutations of his friend in a gesture that was, it was, you know, instinctive to me to connect that with my grandfather. It was this act of courtesy of two people walking down the street, just, you know, saying hello to each other. And so it was deeper things like that as well. And uh, I think this was why uh, I was able to explore it, as you said, from beyond the journalistic perspective. Um, and, you know, I, the, the process was really learning to use these kind of uh, insights then in the book. I think it's wonderful to actually, you know, have literature mediate a city to you or a place. There is this uh, wonderful writer, Buddhadev Bose, in Bengali. And he also didn't travel, you know, for much of his life until he was in his late 50s, 60s. I think for the first time he went to England. And before he had actually been to places, he could tell people what he would see. Simply yeah. his intimate knowledge of English literature or European literature of a certain era. And, and this actually makes you think of what good writing, what good literature can do to you. And this is a similar experience you had almost, you know, seeing the city before you have seen it, almost being kind of haunted by memories of the city. Absolutely, yeah. And as you say, like this literature was so varied as well, you know, because Kabul is a place that's deeply inscribed in a way by writing. But um, my grandfather's experience of that writing was completely different from mine. Like he associated with it through 
things that were closer at hand, which was you know, Persian or Urdu or you know, literature that was close to him. And I had to sort of go through, or I did go through Western writing, which was a completely different texture to it. So it, it's also interesting how these two things were, I was you know, sort of bringing them to, he brought them together for me in a sense. I think these are two very rich traditions, you know, the Persian tradition and the European tradition, which kind of create a very composite and complex picture. I mean, just as you were reading the foreword, I was thinking of this contrast between the new Kabul and the old, and it's so distinctly physically marked. And that uh, sort of sense almost carries through into your narrative from the beginning to the end. Um, so when you first arrived there, did you have this sense of, you know, a tradition and modernity kind of colliding? I know this sounds like a cliche, but was it palpable in the way people are in the you know, daily register of life when you arrived? Um, I mean, when I first arrived 2006, so the arc of the book is essentially um, early 2006 to 2013. And like I said, 2006 was about five years after the overthrow of the Taliban. There were, it was still a time of hope and things seemed possible and it seemed sort of like the conflict was on its way out. And 2013 was when ISAF uh, or the, you know, the NATO forces had formally ended their combat operations in Afghanistan. Of course, the war took over a much longer time, drew out much longer. And as you know, where we are still, it's not over in any sense. Um, but this was the arc of the book. So this is, of course, this change, you know, what you're talking about, the tradition and modernity was a sort of constant that I felt um, was going on and is still going on, really. As it would in most other cities, I think when I got there in 2006, it was very visually, it was quite present because um, the old city was, is, as in many other cities in India as well, it's more congested, it's densely packed. Um, the streets are narrower and the suburbs, which were the newer part of the city, were sort of broader roads, you know, more residential areas. And you could see that um, older houses were being slowly torn down malls were coming up or multi-story apartments were coming up in the suburbs. So again, this is something quite uh, echoing what ha what was happening in Aligarh at that at that time because there are a lot of old sort of havelis or portis that people that are now empty because the inhabitants have either died or the children have moved away and they've been sold and residential apartments are being built there. So I could see this, of course, and I think this is one of the threads of the book is how the mood of the city changes um, from 2006 to 13. Absolutely. I think this time that you spend, because, you know, journalists actually parachute themselves in and then come out. But this good fortune of having to spend yeah. so many years, you know, repeatedly going back. And also, I think coming away from a city is very important to be able to reflect on it, to be able to go back to it and see it with new eyes, especially in contrast to the surroundings that you have grown up in or live in currently. So you had that advantage of repeated uh, visiting but when did the idea of the book actually come together in your mind? Um, I mean, when I, when I went there, it was uh, to work in a radio and TV production um, channel. So I didn't go with the plan of writing a book, but of course, being a journalist, I was planning to write. And uh, I think this is, as you say, the, one of the biggest assets I had was um, that I could keep going back. I could chase stories over time. I had the luxury of watching things change because the time I spent there was substantial. And so it wasn't like I was on a deadline for anything. So things unfolded for me. And since I could come back to, you know, contrast, as you say, that I would go and come back and I would see what has changed. But also I came back to continuity because many of the people I met would be the same people. They were my friends or people I would hang out with or work with. And they were the ones who opened up the city for me with this incredible generosity and intimacy. So this was a huge... Uh, uh, factor in how the book happened. And while I was writing for newspapers in India, um, I, was, I would write for magazines as well. Uh, of course, I would end up reporting the stories, but I would end up writing them in a way that it was uh, digestible for the publication. So either it would be news format or even feature stories. And they follow a certain format. So I felt that the most interesting stuff that I was seeing or the most telling details I was seeing were the ones that I was leaving out, you know. So if this was like a film, there would be the outtakes on the floor. And I didn't uh, sort of feel that I was communicating the reality of being in Kabul or the things that really mattered at that time. And this sort of grew uh, the urge to do this through 
I started writing longer pieces for more, li- more literary pieces or experimenting with themes as far as I could. And uh, from there, I think uh, I got the idea that this could be a book. But I was also very sure that I didn't want it to be a journalistic account. And, uh, you know, because I feel there have been so many of those. And uh, I was quite certain that the book has to be about the city. And uh, I think my approach was to sort of the idea of the book grew from that desire. It wasn't that I wanted to write a book and then I started looking for stories to fit into it. But because I felt like this is a city that I've, I've been so privileged to have seen, and I've been privileged to have seen it in, in a way that many other people who come from abroad don't get to see it, experience it like this. You end, very often people who came to work from abroad, especially later, would end up living in compounds or they would have to go out only in cars or you know, sort of armored cars or they would have to have security with them and so on. And I had a lot of advantages in that sense. So I wanted to be able to, to talk about what it felt like to walk down a street and see, you know, you could just see the mud on the walls and see the imprints of the fingers that had made that uh, texture. And that connected you to, a, to the city in a certain way. What is that feeling you get mm-hmm. when you are there and, and the sun is a certain way and you can see the mountains and you can, you know, hear the sounds of the cityscape? What is that feeling and how does it connect to people who feel that Kabul is a city very far away? Very often, like people would ask me, you know, oh, you're going to Afghanistan, you're going to Kabul, what is it like there? And um, in the intonation of like the there was the sense of distance. And I was always very interested in that because obviously it's embedded in that thought that this is a place unlike any other place that we know, or it's a place unimaginable to us. And I was very keen to sort of deal with to negotiate that tension and to say well you know of course it's a city that you haven't seen but it's also such so much of a city that you feel like you do know that you can connect with and in it i think that sense of danger is what people associate it with now when you think of kabul but ironically you know somebody traveling from say london coming to delhi might feel the same sense of danger because it's a completely new city to them yeah yeah so it only sort of the perspective slightly changes with the places that you go to. Um, I'll come to the walking part in a bit, but you know, the seeing part is so interesting to me because as journalists, most of us are trained to see what is in front of us. And your book, you know, you call it Shadow City. And also there's a line somewhere where you say that a city reveals uh, to you a lot more than what, uh, when, you, when you start noticing what is missing from it. So this idea of seeing what is not there is so germane to the writing of your book, I feel. And it sort of reminded me of even Italo Calvino's, you know, Invisible Cities, which is basically about these cities of the mind almost. Was that sense of, you know, that literary history and the physical history of the city coming together, was it actively sort of operating in your mind when you were sort of living in Kabul or was it a retrospective thing when you came back from it and thought about it? No, it was definitely, I mean, it took time. I wouldn't say as soon as I got there, I had this sense. It took a, a while. But uh, certainly while I was there, I became aware of the kind of layers that are available to, to someone who wants to investigate them or that are available if you start to, as you say, start looking. Um, Calvino, of course, was, is a huge, you know, I wouldn't say influence, but it's such a beautiful way to, to think about writing and to think about cities. Um, but I think in this case, I was also a little bit primed to do this because uh, growing up in Aligarh, which is, uh, you know, it's near Delhi, it's, uh, I, was, I lived in a joint family my, and we never really went out much with women and me and my cousins were around the same age. So we spent a lot of time inside the house and I was very ready to sort of explore a city in, in all the different ways, uh, of, through reading, through conversations, through stories, through mythology. This was all exploration that I felt like done. So it never felt like, I would hear this often from women from elsewhere that, you know, there's nothing to do in the evenings. And this, ironically, it's something I'd heard even in Aligarh, that, mm. you know, people who came from abroad or from elsewhere in India would say, well, what do you do here? And we would just be like, you know, I I literally didn't understand the question because I felt there was so much going on. (laughs) So I think this was not uh, this was not a difficult, uh, you know, route for me to take. Um, And I found that this was uh, the people I lived with. They had, uh, you know, stories to tell me about. Like my housemate, he would tell me about being uh, 
a young man in Kabul and how he was like this Sharazad like figure just spinning out every evening in beautiful stories about cinema halls about you know special bakeries about or the baker who made baklava with almonds in it you know and this is wonderful stuff to be able to hear and i think a lot of it is because i was able to to access the city through travelies like this and to have this approach of intimacy with them um again i think baba had a big role to play my grandfather because he had also i mean he would tell me stuff about the city that made it very obvious that what i was seeing was only a part of it you know for instance um there's a passage in the book where he talks about um poetry and about how ifbal one of his favorite poets had gone to kabul and uh, you know just reading reading his work from the city it felt so much closer to and of course ifbal had a completely different version of afghanistan of kabul and it just felt like a city that is so much more than the immediate history of war which is of course extremely visually uh, in terms of the news in terms of the reading in terms of the conversations of course it is very much there um but there is so much more to it and i think it wasn't hard to get to it but and once once i realized this it seemed like such an obvious thing but it was definitely because these ideas are so embedded it takes mm-hmm. a little bit of effort to get away from them once you do of course it becomes clear that there's so much more to it but it was certainly i don't think it was an aha moment mm-hmm. but it was a process of having aha moments you know that that led me to putting everything together as it were yeah i think the anonymity of being in a new city also must be very exciting because you lived in other cities in the world and in india as well uh when you go back, when you came back from say uh, kabul to aligarh or you know in india any other indian city did you miss that sense of anonymity that you know, i never really felt that in kabul it it didn't feel like this, the way i feel anonymous say in berlin or i would feel anonymous in london i didn't feel that in in kabul the overwhelming emotion was one of familiarity of that strange half uh, recognition you know um and again because i was with people who i was working with up front and i was working with living with them and i wasn't staying in a guest house or i mean most of the time i wasn't so i think that wasn't my emotion with kabul at all so when i would come back i would sort of miss the familiarity not so much the anonymity right right you know the the obvious question is actually you know as a woman you're sort of showing us the city you know we see the city through your eyes did you feel that walking in kabul i mean you must have felt because you write about it as well was a very gendered experience in the way that also walking in indian cities often is and how did that affect you as a flaneur as it were you know like the sort of the storied tradition of walking cities that we have from europe for instance yes of course it was extremely gendered and um, this is where actually i begin the book from about how walking in aligarh um, is an extremely gendered act and i think uh, this is something that a lot of women have connected with since the book has come out is the fact that if you step out onto the streets in most i would say many places in india you are expected to have a reason to have your body out in the city in this way you cannot be out for leisure you can't simply be strolling around like men do um and i think this is so i already had that posture i already had that knowledge and i also had the sort of sense of negoci- negotiability of these spaces like you know okay so perhaps this is something i can try so when i was told you know please never walk in kabul i felt like this was just one more way in which the city was familiar to me because i'd heard this before and i sort of knew how to deal with a picture like this before so that added to my sort of relationship with kabul almost the day i got there and um i think uh, you know it's interesting how this this grew and it sort of became a part of the whole book it wasn't initially my idea to write it in this way but it but it was just impossible to ignore and i think partly the reason why i could do this was because i was open to the idea of wandering and i i saw great potential in the idea of of taking detours in digression this was something that freed me up thematically structurally in terms of concepts and i found i think it's a very very powerful idea for a narrator to adopt and because so much about kabul seems to be predetermined so mm-hmm. much about it seems known you know 
And I love the idea of just going away from all of that and seeing everything from a different perspective. And my journey really, um, as an Indian woman, you know, like I said, this is a terrain that has been heavily inscribed by usually by white men um, and sort of collide against these authority figures. And a lot of what I found interesting wasn't really what you would expect in a book about Kabul. I wasn't interested in writing about issues. I wasn't interested in even taking up a sort of topical theme. So how would I, how do I do this then? And for me, the journey was seeing this approach as an asset. I think that was a huge revelation for me. And I mean, I'm happy to share this with other people who are struggling, you know, because I feel this is a, this is a process a lot of writers go through. And um, I think the idea of being, of owning your own path and of being completely free to wander through this terrain was one that I found really, really powerful. And then I could just sort of you know, take what I wanted to write about and, and just not do the other stuff, which is a great thing for a writer. It's a gift to get. Absolutely. I also felt that you were never shy of uh, confronting some facts that you didn't understand enough because they were culturally so different. There are people who don't exactly give you what you want to know as a journalist when you question them. Some people just stop you in your tracks and say, no, we don't want to talk about it. Yeah. And it's very heartening you know, to read that there are these real blocks where people will not yield you what you want to know. That, that itself is a, is a kind of very interesting aspect of the book to me, that it doesn't try to explain everything as journalism does. Yeah, I think this was also important to me because in Kabul, people very often I see the journalists or I would see the journalists go with a preconceived notion of the story they want to write. This is true, I think, everywhere, even in India. We see people yeah. who already know the story they want to write and they just see the quotes to fit into it. But in Kabul, it became a little more obvious because, you know, it was so, like it was so polar. And uh, it was always the terms of the questioning were always sort of, pre-Taliban and post-Taliban, as if the city had no history before that. And uh, this was, I think, it, I felt it important to acknowledge that well, very often people aren't going to give you what you want to hear, and that should be fine. Um, many places I have uh, acknowledged the sort of variability of accounts, you know, because memory is so fallible and we choose what we want to remember or not. And I think it's extremely important, especially in a city like Kabul, where the past is so... Um, important, it's so colored, and yet it's almost invisible to, to people from the outside. So mm. To acknowledge that there are so many flashing accounts of the city, and, and you know, it, I, sometimes I don't know, and sometimes people don't tell me things. The city is a sum of its contradictions, basically, and conflicts. Um, I also wanted to ask you about your specific positioning of yourself as a narrator, you know. Um, you don't get too close to yourself as a narrator, as it were. You know, you're almost writing about yourself as a character. You're slightly removed. Uh, the impulse in this kind of a narrative is to be very autobiographical, very strongly kind of talk about your feelings and sensations and, you know, and everything. Uh, was that a very conscious decision of positioning yourself into the narrative in this form? Yeah, it was very conscious. In fact, I would have rather not been in the book at all. <laughs> that was where I began from. <laughs> but... Um... And I think this is a really good question because I think it touches on my decisions, but also on the structure of publishing and what is expected from writers um, when they go into a place that is foreign to them or when you go into the sort of territory, which is either war reporting or travel reporting. And uh, so, I mean, I'll answer it in two parts. One, for myself, I was keen to, like I said, I wanted it to be a story about Kabul. And a journalist in Kabul, this is a story we've heard many times before. I didn't see the need to center this narrative any longer. So I was very clear that this isn't, uh, this isn't a track I'm interested in pursuing. But at the same time, it seemed uh, you know, pointless to try to erase myself because this was my perspective that I'm offering. And the richness, I think, of my grandfather's perspective or the linkages I was able to make between India and Kabul, there was no reason also to drop them. So I... I my sort of um, decision was to keep myself as the narrator to, so that I could be a sort of function as the window that kept opening into the city. And my experiences come into it in as much as they let you into a different way of seeing the city, which I think is a, I think it's a good balance right now. And I feel like I've written a lot about myself. I don't feel like I'm invisible. I feel, I've written about things that are so precious to me about my, 
my grandfather, about my family, about the books. You know, these are things which are extremely deep, and uh, you know, I I love them so much, and I've written about them. So I wouldn't say I was trying to hold back, but yes, I was very conscious that the heroine of this book is is the city, um, and this was a difficult, slightly difficult position to hold on to um, because the expectation, as you say, is for it to be straightforward memoir, and uh, the story then is of the transformation of the person who's telling you the story, or you hear the story of of the city mediated by this uh, sort of interpreter, which is which is someone you can identify with. And uh, I think I I wasn't comfortable with that simply because I feel like the, the city speaks to itself, and the people in the city are able to tell their own stories wonderfully without needing this kind of uh, mediary. So the, for this reason, I worked for a any long time on developing the book until I was confident that it could stand on its own. And many places, uh, publishers or editors didn't take it because it was not memoir. And, they, and I kept getting this feedback, I'll put more of yourself in it, more of yourself in it. And I simply didn't see the need to do that. So I spent a lot of time developing the book so that I could say, no, this is the direction. And I could prove that this is the direction that I could maintain through the book. And fortunately, I had uh, enough support by that time uh, from people to be able to take it and go with it. Of course, it changed a lot during the editing, but uh, this was something that I was keen to maintain. I think uh, it's very interesting because, as you said, you put quite a lot of yourself in the book because you talk about your family and your history and all of that. But what I found really interesting is the distance you can maintain, even from that narrative voice, because I always felt that it was not something which was just you know, scattered for the sake of being scattered. It was a much more cohesive kind of thoughtful, intellectual kind of scaffolding that we're getting to actually see the city through your eyes, to better understand it. Because to understand it through your eyes, we need to see where you come from as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and that really comes through really well, I think, in the book. Um, I have, you know, very sort of favorite chapters in the book. Uh, one is, of course, the cinema chapter, which I felt that it was like a blast of India suddenly in the middle mm -hmm. of Kabul. And I wondered if you would like to read a bit from that chapter and maybe we could talk about, you know, cinema and what it does to modern contemporary Kabul. Sure. Um, yeah, I can, I can do that. Just, just tell me how we're doing for time so I know what... Uh, we have about 15 minutes more to talk. Okay, that's yeah. great. Um, yeah, I'm very fond of this chapter myself, Shamak, because as you know, I work very closely with uh, filmmakers and with uh, media professionals. So a lot of my time was spent around people who were working in film. And um, it, it's, uh, I was able to get very close to this world. So I was, it was a real privilege to be able to write about it. Uh, yesterday, I learned that one of the cinemas in Kabul, Park Cinema, has been demolished. And it was a sort of beautiful building in the middle of Sharanoff Park. And... Uh, obviously very sad to hear that so I thought I would read a bit from the section on cinema that describes the different theaters and again I feel like cinema was a beautiful entry for me to get into the city because I had heard that Kabulis were very fond of uh, Indian films, Hindi films and it was a sort of craze for popular Bollywood fare but even then I was overwhelmed by the degree to which they were into it and uh, but it was also a lot more than that. There was a lot of diversity in the kind of films that were being made. And uh, that's a lot of the book of, of this chapter is about that diversity as well. But also if you see, by the time I got there, the cinemas were not really, they were, even if they were functioning, they were not spaces where families would go to watch films. There were, hardly, there were never any women in there. Um, so most of the film viewing was done at home on VCDs. But this, the halls were all there, and uh, the section is sort of about how different halls, I think this is something, again, familiar, like different halls are different characters, and you can sort of see the whole city through the different cinemas. So I'll start with this section. A walk through the history of cinema halls in Kabul would begin, as the city does, in the heart of the old city. Among the first to be built was Behzad, located near Shor Bazaar, a bustling street that ran parallel to the Jada and Evan. A relative of Barmak lived in the area and had watched his first film at this theatre during the brief reign of Habibullah Kalakani in 1929. This relative had tried to sneak into the women-only matinee on a Tuesday while wearing a chadari, the all-enveloping veil that is so emblematic of Afghan women, but had been caught. 
Cinema Kabul, located across the river, was also built in the 1920s. It catered to the more upmarket audience of the new suburb and hence screened both Indian and American films. During the silent movie era, there would be live performances by musicians on the piano and the violin accompanying the film. Several theaters came up across the capital in the 1950s and 60s, proving the popularity of movie watching in Kabul. There was even one just for women. Most of these theaters showed popular Indian movies to a devoted audience. Families who came to Kabul from smaller towns during vacations would watch the same film several times during their stay. In a dizzying subcontinental twist, an older friend who grew up in Pakistan told me that he sometimes traveled from Lahore to Kabul or Jalalabad as a teenager, so he could watch the Indian fair that was banned in his own country. Park cinema, on the other hand, was part of a constellation of elite establishments that lined Sharanaw during the 1970s. It showed Hollywood films that had been dubbed into Persian in Iran, as well as Italian and French fare. Nearby was a tennis court and playground, and a kiosk that sold imported comic books featuring Tarzan and Mandrake the Magician. The cinema was so exclusive, Khalid told me, that people were not allowed to enter in traditional Afghan clothes. You could rent trousers from stalls just outside the hall. From these stories, I learned that in Kabul, like in Aligarh, cinema was an escape. It was also a place of aspiration, a window to a world that was still far away, still full of wonders. I think this um, window to the world comes through so beautifully in that um, episode where you write about the women who were trapped at home during the Taliban regime and they were watching Hindi movies in darkened rooms. I mean, that image is so vivid and rich. I couldn't just get it out of my head, you know, I kept thinking about it. Yeah, it's absolutely remarkable. Um, so, you know, I was just wondering about the richness of fantasy. Like cinema, is, as we know, is a great melting pot, as it were. Um, why do you think this rich Indian sort of cinema fantasy life appeals to the Kabulis so much? What, what, what was your sort of understanding of it? I mean, I would say um, partly familiarity, partly availability, for sure. These are all factors. But um, because it's not recent, I mean, people from an older generation, they were really uh, into like sort of Pakiza was, I think, the film that was referred to very, very often. And people just remember that scene where Meena Kumari is leaving her footprints with blood on the on the floor and so on. So, uh, and remember there was some film shot in Afghanistan as well, like uh, really? uh, I think it was uh, Dharmatma that was shot with Firoz Khan and Hima Malini. And they, that was a huge event in many people's lives. So I think it was a mix of that and as well as the cultural familiarity. I mean, Bollywood was popular all over the world. And I think mm -hmm. for much of the same mm -hmm. reasons, it struck a chord with, uh, with Kabulis as well. Um, like you said, the fantasy element of it is, is of course important and and in Kabul through the war I think it became so interesting because my friend told me that during the civil war the cinema stayed open and uh, people would go there to watch films just to get away from the, the horrors they were living through and many of these would be Indian films and they would be you know sort of violence on the screen but it would be an escape from the reality and I found it really interesting, even in the mainstream films or the popular films that were being made, so much of it was derived from popular Indian or Hindi films. And uh, it was just, you know, it was like watching that same edifice in miniature. You know, it was like a, a way of negotiating or putting yourself in that story, which was also escape um, in a way from the harsh realities of their own lives or, the, or what they had lived through. So I thought, I, I think really, it's just remarkable the degree to which uh, just it's popular, but also there is, it's not the only thing that exists. Because there's a generation of uh, young Afghans who had grown up in Iran as well, and um, they had come back to Kabul, uh, which they had always thought of as their home, but they'd never actually seen the city. So when they came back, um, and they hold, their whole sort of cinematic references are different, not so much Indian, but more world cinema, Iranian cinema. And uh, I was fortunate enough to interact with a lot of them and see them working. And they kind of discovered the city by shooting it, by making films in it. And uh, this was really interesting for me to watch as well, because they negotiated the city completely differently. And in their films, I think, is a wonderful window into Kabul from this era, 2006 to 13. 
um, you can see how the city is transforming. So they could get up close, they could shoot with um, a lot of uh, intimacy, they could shoot with access, they could just take the camera anywhere. And uh, I think it's important to realize that there are many voices of, in cinema that emerge during this time as well. I think it's very interesting, you know, I think uh, your friend Nazira, who's studying French, am I right? She had, yeah. And I was thinking, you know, what must her uh, sort of imagination be like? Because she's reading a very European sort of language and its culture and absorbing all these influences. And how must that translate into her daily life, you know, like surrounded in this sort of very patriarchal society that she lives in? How do you think young Kabulis sort of negotiate with that difference of the world that's out there, what they're studying and their home, as it were, you know, like what they're seeing around them? I mean, this is a question I'm not really the perfect person to answer, but from my experience until 2013, and remember things have changed again since 2013, it's been another seven years. And um, I think one of the interesting things that's happened is the prevalence of the internet and uh, people just find, you know, being able to access news from around the world, being able to say what they want to say as well around the world. But I would say that people, young Kabulis, were extremely brave in the sense that they in, they believed in creating a future for themselves that had these kind of values of openness, of pluralism, of, of being able to debate with each other, of being able to overcome differences. And I was always very struck by it, by the humanity of their conversations, you know. And this was this is a generation that has never seen peace. They have no memory of, of a time without war. And yet they had this commitment and yet they had this belief. Of course, a lot of people at, in 2013, as I wrote, many people began leaving also because they couldn't see a future for themselves in the city. And very difficult decision. And but I was able to continue my reporting on some of these people in Germany a few years after. And uh, it's, it's really sort of, you know, it's, it's interesting to see because the, the displacement from Kabul, again, is not new. In the 70s, there was a wave of people who left through the war, people have left, and now there is this other uh, you know, wave of uh, refugees who have settled somewhere else, and you can almost see a city kind of growing outside of the city. And it has many layers, and it has obviously different kind of uh, textures to it. But this was the new kind of uh, layer I found to it. And again, many of these people were young Kabulis who had believed in the city, and now they were trying to create a life for themselves as creative professionals, filmmakers or writers or musicians in a context that didn't really recognize them as creative people. You know, I only saw them as refugees. It didn't really see that they would have the capacity to create something. I, I think it's also very interesting, you know, you say at some point that um, it was a time of not war and not peace either. And to have to live through that limbo, you know, like you, I don't think it's a very pleasant experience not to know what politically, socially uh, you are going through, as it were. And, and that must be really, really tough to be a young person in that kind of a society in flux, continually in flux. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why, like, many of these decisions were so difficult, you know. I mean, and everyone took their own decisions. Of course, there are people who stayed back. There are people for whom leaving was not an option. There were people who left and came back. You know, so it's a, it's such a, it's, it's, it's a continuum, which is what I try to talk about in the book, that in Kabul, you can't really say that um, you've come home or you've left because there's this constant shift between uh, leaving and arriving and being a refugee again and again, which is so heartbreaking to see in these families. I mean, so many people thought they were coming back for good, only to be displaced yet again. And uh, many people who tried to settle abroad ended up coming back again. Uh, so it's, it's like you said, it's a constant flux. And um, of course, it's difficult. And this is a generation I feel that is really um, remarkable in, in being able to negotiate this in some way. I found it uh, very interesting, the last chapter on weddings and dating. And, you know, uh, I think there's a passage where you write about cafe culture, you know, like this whole cappuccino that they're going right, to. Yeah. And it's so heartbreaking to think that, you know, going to a cafe is such an occasion and, and to be able to sort of sit next to a girl and have a coffee is, is a big thing for a boy there. Um, I was uh, also deeply moved by the chapter on the book, book, bookshop that you, that you visited. And I wondered, like, uh, if you would like to talk about that a bit. And because, you know, being a reader, being sort of steeped in this Persian poetry through your grandfather, 
how did that moment feel? Was it like sort of walking into a kind of time capsule? Like, what did that moment feel like finding that bookshop? Are you being the the books the book market on the on the mountain? Um, uh, no, the one which uh, about which the book the bookseller of Kabul has been written. Right. Uh, okay. Yeah. I mean, that's a that's an institution. That's a city sort of landmark. So right. that was a place where I knew I would would have to certainly have to visit. And uh, I mean, it it's obviously it's a you know it's a great feeling to be able to walk into a bookshop and see books you can read. Uh, but it's also, I mean, it wasn't, um, it wasn't unexpected because I knew this place existed. I'd read about it and so on. But what I loved was the fact that it was two, almost like two different stores. You know, like there was the English section downstairs, and there was the Persian section upstairs. And you know, he's the prices were completely different, and it was just like it was being able to sort of bring together all these different themes from in the city and. Uh, from there, I think I realized that you really have to think about who are you as a reader. Before, where you, everyone would say, "Oh, there's not nothing to read here. There's nothing to read here," which is ridiculous if you think about it. It's simply that I mean, what you're looking for is is really the question: How, how are you located as a reader? I can't read simply because I can't read the languages, the many languages in that city. In the library, I found manuscripts in so many different languages. There was Persian. There was Arabic. There was Turkish, there was English, you know, or even Urdu books. So it's really, I think, walking into a bookstore in Kabul is to understand that the literary life of a city it really has, again, it takes a shift in perspective to be able to see it. And uh, again, it's so ingrained in in a, in a viewer or person who thinks about Kabul that this would have, this kind of knowledge would have to come in English, that you simply invisibilize the abundance that's there. Also, I think it makes a city very real and ordinary, not a mythic city which is devastated yeah. by war. You know, yeah, like absolutely. that one dimensional image that we have of Kabul, of this broken city, is immediately sort of gone when you get into that bookshop uh, and we go in with you and just look at the books and talk to this man. Yeah, so, and the, uh, fact, the fact that he could send a book back with me for my grandfather, you know, he gave me a copy, an abridged version of the Shanama. And he said, well, this is for your grandfather. And the fact that you're exchanging books with this uh, bookseller in Kabul and a gentleman in, in Aligarh, it again shows you like how this city is literally like is connected to the entire region and it's much larger than you, you, you would think it would be. And obviously, like the, the richness of Persian literature is, Kabul is very much a part of that tradition as well. So I think for me, the really interesting moment came when my grandfather told me in the Shanama that the princess uh, Rudaba, who is the mother of uh, Rustam, the very famous Persian hero, she is a princess of Kabul. And that really blew my mind. And then, of course, I read that section. And it was so beautiful because you just see Kabul in a completely different way, described in this, in this epic poem you know, centuries ago. I want to just, um, so there are a couple of questions from the audience. But before I come to that, I just want to ask you one last thing which is basically, you know, like this shift between looking at Kabul through the lens of history. It's such a storied city with like so much history everywhere with Buddhism, with Mughals, like so many things. And then sort of coming to look at contemporary Kabul where you go into the wedding, for instance, and, and look at it, uh, those sort of lavish extravagant weddings that, that you sort of went and saw. Uh, would you say that there is any sense of continuity between that past and this present, like, and what that continuity would be? That's a really good question. I mean, um, maybe not entirely in the wedding hall, <laughs> but in daily life, certainly. I mean, you see so much uh, of, like, references to the Shahnameh, for instance, are very, very ordinary stories are, are ancient, even in the, uh, you know, the chance that the children three children who do spun, which is a sort of uh, smoke which uh, they swirl around you and that's like a talisman to ward off evil. And even in the chants that they that they perform while doing this act, it connects you to the history of the city. Of course, it's done. It's almost unconscious, but it exists. So I think definitely there is a lot of continuity with the awareness of rupture of the war. And remember, the, we're not only talking about Taliban so often, and I was a part of this, like, you go to Kabul and you think in terms of Taliban and post-Taliban and the period of the civil war which preceded the Taliban is not really discussed so much. And I think that's a lot of the 
for instance, when I saw the uh, cinema the first time in Kabul, it was this broken structure, and I assumed that it was broken by the Taliban. But actually, it had been destroyed during the civil war, and a uh, lot of the city was actually destroyed during the during this period. So the rupture is also you know, is also different from how we conceive of it. So uh, and you know there is a lot of continuity between that violence as well, which which is carried for forth into the city now. So my I think my attempt was also to see the tracks that war has left in the everyday. And with modern warfare, you can't really say where is the front line. You know, I think this was a big realization for me through the book is that, so is it where the suicide bombers are? Is it where the drones are? Is it in the spaces where children who have inherited this uh, addiction to heroin and opium are hiding and, and you know, they're taking drugs? Is it in the subterranean city? This is all connected to what's not separate. And it's also a part of your everyday city as well. So a lot of it is recognizing these kind of continuities as well, I think, and, and recognizing that these are, if we're talking about war reportage, we do have to talk about this as well. Of course, it is all of the other stuff and, and the sort of things that we think of as being war reportage. But I feel like it's important to broaden that sense and to recognize these things as well. Of course, and also the sense of class, you know, like there's a certain class of people which will al always be worse affected than the others. And war reportage often doesn't take account of that in, in a way that, you know, it should, I feel, which also comes through your book very, very sort of uh, beautifully, this, the, the de detailing of the characters and, and their experiences. I'm just going to read out a couple of questions that people have. Uh, Shaista Taskeen, she's asking, can a writer have multiple homelands? and be a global soul in an era when totalitarian tendencies want to box our identities to one nation? That's a really good question, Shaisa. Um, I can only answer for myself. I suspect every writer will have a different answer to this. But I think for me, being an Indian woman is a very sort of integral part of the way in which I approach the world and which I write about it, as it was very obvious in, in this book. So I think that this isn't something I that I would try to uh, dilute or that I would have issue with. But certainly, I think what I enjoyed a lot and which I enjoy reading as well is being able to find the connections between the place you're from and the places you go to. And I think certainly I would agree with you that this sort of tendency to box us into tiny little uh, you know, categories is completely counter to that sense. And good literature will never be possible if we, if we fall into that tendency as well. Um, Shushobhan Roy is asking, were you influenced by Khalid Hosseini's works? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, uh, I did read Khalid Hosseini before I went to Kabul the first time. And, uh, you know, I found that book very moving. Uh, the first time I went, of course, there are many, many discussions to be had around many of the themes that he's come up with. But I think what he did do, what this book did do, and this is something I was told by multiple editors and publishers, is that he put Afghanistan on the literary map of the world, and I suppose that's a good thing. Because once you know, once that happens, and there is space for books like mine as well. And uh, so I wouldn't say he influenced my writing, but uh, if there is space opened up by popular books like this, then I think that that's good. And I hope that a book like mine would also maybe open up space for slightly, you know, different or tangential ideas to talk about Kabul as well. It will introduce more complexity into the narrative. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. <laughs> Instead of the more sort of romanticized kind of sanitized version that we get in. Yeah, this. yeah. And also like the, I mean, there's so many discussions around his other work as well, which, uh, you know, I think the later novels as well. So I want to actually ask you, Taran, like, uh, do you feel longing to go back to Kabul after all these years? Do you feel like the city draws you? There are some cities which where we always want to go back from time to time. Is that one of those cities? Yeah, I do. I really do want to go back to Kabul. And uh, of course, I, I know that I'll return to a city that's completely different from the one I've left behind. Um, it's also a city that's emptier in the sense, uh, because a lot of the people I spend most of my time with, I worked with, were very, very dear to me. My friends, their families, they've left. And uh, a lot depends on the way of return. I think for me, that would be a very important consideration. And uh, to return to a city, to the city, to live in a compound or to live in a sort of barricaded house would be heartbreaking for me. So yeah, I do want to return, but I mean, 
uh, I know that it wouldn't be for the city I, I remember so fondly. It's so interesting, right? Because there is a palpable sense of danger then and now living in Kabul, and yet a city is so powerful in its own, you know, field of influence that it still draws you back to itself. I mean, that is the greatness of a city, I suppose. You know, knowing very well that there are real dangers around, you want to visit it and stay there. Yeah, and like you said, uh, Shamak, the city is is not it's not a static place. Although, uh, unfortunately, now I think what's happening is again that Kabul is vanishing from the imagination of the world. You know, just like last week, there was this terrible attack on Kabul University, which was so heartbreaking to see. It was such such a beautiful space, and these young men and women who are there to study have been brutally murdered, and um, it's really, really uh, tragic what's happening. Mm-hmm. So, of course, there's that sense of danger, but I'm. I also know that there must be so many other stories, and I would love to read them. You know, I would love to see this path being broadened of what's going on now, who, what is changing, what is new, what is old, what is uh, you know sort of come back in the cyclical way of history. Um, so I would be very keen to continue this relationship, at least in terms of being a reader about Kabul. We have a couple of more questions. Uh, Isha Tyagi is asking, how have the people who were your entry points for the stories of Kabul received your book? Um, so my, they've all been super supportive. And most of what I heard from them was, why is it taking you so long to finish the book? When is it going to be over? So <laughs> I'm finally able to give them an answer, which is wonderful. And uh, yeah, I mean, the response from them has been really, really encouraging and wonderful. Um, another question from Shushobhun. He's asking, is there any other city in which you would like to live in and write a book about? So many. <laughs> I would uh, love to live in Istanbul and write about it. I think right now I'm dreaming of Uzbekistan, uh, sort of continuing the journey through the Silk Route. Uh, I think these are all cities that, again, they're so present in, in our imagination. And they're so, they loom very large in the kind of stories we've heard. And, if they again feel like places that are known, but uh, there's such an interesting mix of these, this mythology and then the modernity and the kind of tussle, political tussles that are going on right now as well. So I, I mean, I could spend my life doing this. Well, that's a great answer to actually <laughs> <laughs> end this conversation on. But I'm just going to ask you one last thing is, um, if there's only one city that you wanted to live in, which city would that be? Oh, that's such a tough one. Um, it would probably be a city I haven't visited yet, you know, because I always feel like that's the place where I would really enjoy being in. Um, maybe Istanbul, I think. I think that would have hold enough contradictions and, you know, uh, enough kind of uh, stories to be able to pull me through the rest of my life. Exactly. It's again one of those beautiful synthesis of the East and the West and yeah. so many different cultures coming there. Yeah, I will miss having my grandfather to explore it with me. So. But he's given you the eyes to see it. <laughs> yeah. That's the thing. That's the more important thing. Yeah, it's a great gift. Um, so thank you so much, Taran. This is such a pleasure talking to you. And, you know, I feel a longing for visiting new cities after speaking to you and reading your book. Yes, let's hope, you know, we come back to a world where travel is possible again. Uh, and we can all sort of wander freely in the world again soon. We, so many of us might be uh, doing that. And okay, just before we depart, there's one last question, which is also interesting. Um, what would the one Indian city be where you would like to stay and write about? Indian city. Um, it's a really tough question. Um, Maybe I mean, there's so know. many. <laughs> there's so many places that are so interesting. Uh, I think. It would probably be a small town like Dehradun or, you know, like uh, Shimla. Uh, maybe I'm just thinking of the mountains because I haven't been to the mountains this year. Or I think like I would like to live in a city that's small but is becoming bigger and bigger. So, yeah, a place where, I, where again, it would be like Aligarh in the sense that I'm used to the scale of it, but is, again, sort of drawing the world towards itself. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you, IHS, for organizing this. Great. Thank you so much for joining us. This has been a wonderful session. And uh, I've also thoroughly enjoyed reading Taran's book. And I really hope that people who've attended do pick it up. Uh, It'll make you want to go to Kabul and definitely walk in Kabul. I mean, if nothing else.
considering all of us want to travel. Uh, to the yeah. audience, uh, just as a reminder, we have all our links in the chat box for our YouTube channel. We're also on Facebook and Twitter and on Instagram if you'd like to follow us and receive regular updates. Uh, thank you, Shoma. Thanks, Taran. And we'll see you next month with our next public tech session. Thank you very much. I just wanted to say thank you to IHS and Shoma for hosting this session. And uh, everyone who listened, thank you for your time. Great. Thanks. Have a good evening, everybody. Bye.